Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Dark Side. I'm JVL, here with my Bulwark colleague, A.B. Stoddard, and everything is terrible. <laughs> A.B., <laughs> let's... I think we just make that our, our normal open. Yeah. That's how we will open every show from now yeah. on. Donald Trump wins in South Carolina, and then John Thune, who is one of the team normal, responsible Republicans, rushes out to endorse him. Thoughts? Yeah. So I um, I was startled by this, even though we knew it was coming. And um, I do recommend that people read Bill Crystal's Morning Shots from yesterday, Monday, February 26th on Boneless Wonders. He talks about why Thune's endorsement triggered him. And it was, I agreed, it was that we sort of thought that people like this would just wait until the absolute last minute and do a perfunctory thing that said, oh, well, it's over. The nomination, you know, he's now the presumptive nominee. He's secured, you know, the requisite amount of delegates. And here we go. But he came out now and didn't have to. And I have... Nikki I, Haley is sitting right I there. I have what he said after January 6th, JVL, which in case anyone missed it, I Please. think they should know that he said... Remind the people. What Donald Trump did to undermine faith in our election system and disrupt the peaceful transfer of power is inexcusable. So he's excused hmm. him. How about that? I mean, I'm shocked. <laughs> Uh, I don't even know if this can rise to the level of contempt because here's, here's my read on that. John Thune wants Mitch McConnell's job. And so he takes it as given that he has to be on the right side of Trump. And the right side means not merely endorsing Trump, but doing so before you absolutely have to. Right. And he wants to be, I mean, I don't even know if he wants to be majority leader under Trump because that's a that is a no thanks job. And so more likely he wants to be minority leader under Biden. And so he's just going to, you know, sit back and let everybody else take care of that son of a bitch for him. And uh, I guess privately vote for Joe Biden and hope that Biden wins. And, uh, right. you know. It just this is this is what they do. This is what McConnell did with the second impeachment. Right. Right. They could. These people all thought Trump should have stopped, been stopped. They all wanted him stopped. They all thought it was important that he be stopped. But none of them was willing to pay the price that it would require in order to stop him because they figured somebody else would do it for me. Right. This is like a classic economic free rider problem. Well, let's talk about this price. John Barrasso wants to be leader more than John Thune does. And I don't know that John Thune can beat John Barrasso out, given the magnification of the Senate Republican Conference and what's going to happen, whether Biden or Trump wins. So if you think about that, yes, you are right, JVL. There is a cost to, being, to getting on last, on board last. Mm -hmm. And there's a tracker, and Trump keeps, uh, he keeps notes on who's coming and when. So Barrasso sweeps in before the Iowa caucuses. I think, right? Right around. There. Yes. Um, and or maybe right after. But he was the first um, of, of the three. And and he wants the job really badly. And um, so if you're Thune and you I think you're right, don't want to be majority leader in a Trump presidency. But you're you're kind of hoping that what you want to reserve the right if there's a boomerang to, against Trump after he loses and sort of normal guy gets to be leader. I mean, he gets to be senator. No one's going to boot him out of his job in South South Dakota. He he just got reelected in 2022. Exactly. And so there's no. So how badly does he want to be leader? I don't even think he does. So he really could have been last. And you wrote today and people should read it. Why there is absolutely if John Thune has one tenth of an excuse, McConnell has not. None. Yeah. He's protecting nothing. He cannot run for another Senate term. He will probably not make it through this Senate term. He will not be reinstated as leader when they come for him, Biden or Trump in the White House, because it's Trump's party. There is 
nothing McConnell gains by being in a month long huh, negotiation between the two camps. Yeah, so this is for what? Let me, let me set the table here. The New York Times reported uh, yesterday, I think, that the McConnell's his trusted advisor is no longer with him. Uh, Josh Holmes, whatever that mope is. Uh, he has been back channeling to Trump campaign people and they've been, they've been working on the terms. I mean, there's a real give and take or, or perhaps just a take and take so more. A real two-way it's not clear what McConnell's out. getting, right? Like what, what is McConnell getting out of this? Like, it's not, you know, it's like unconditional surrender and McConnell wants to know, well, what color pen do I get to sign it That's with? Right. I'd really like to sign it with a blue pen. Will there be some lightsabers in uh, a bowl on the table? Just because. Yeah. Yeah. So Mitch McConnell, who has just been reelected, who is never running again, and who isn't going to be leader of this party, is working out his how do I endorse Trump? <laughs> and I I look at this and I just I don't get it. A guy who who says the most important issues facing America right now or is the war in Europe, right? And who is absolutely not on Trump's side on this and is 100 percent affirmatively just on Biden's side as a matter of policy on what he says is the most important issue facing America. And the second one, the border. He was for the border bill and urged his colleagues to back the he border was for bill the that Trump killed. And he has nothing to gain from endorsing Trump. And what? This is insanity. Trump can't punish what? him. It's over for him. So this is the this is the thing, Right. The guys like Trump, part of their – this is a thing bullies can do, right? Bullies have this sixth sense for understanding who they can bully, right? right? They can just smell the weakness. They can smell the guys who want to cave to him, who will never stand up for themselves, who even if, like, they, they you know, the bully doesn't have anything on him, will just like go – and Trump has that. Right. He has that animal lizard brain instinct to understand. Yeah, I know who the squealers are. And Mitch, you. Right. It's an amazing thing. And it does show us that Trump really did understand the Republican Party much better than anyone else in America. I agree. I, I, will, I will give him great credit for it. He understood the character of the Republican Party more than any of us. I've did. always agreed with you on that. So really keen observation, but he has, as I like to say, no strength without their weakness. He doesn't yeah. have any unless you cower. And as Bill was noting, any amount of resistance to him right now is important. And all yep. of the permission structure that Sarah talks about all the time, that once you fold like John Thune, you let the other people say, okay, I was really deeply ashamed of the way he trashed um, oh, a vet like uh, Nikki Haley's husband, but I'll just go along because if John Thune can, and that's what is, that's what's so tough. And it's, so it's this, anyway, this is more surreal than I thought it was going to be. We talked about this, they were going to do it, but it's, it's even after all this time, it's, it's, it's more surreal, um, especially McConnell, I think. It's wild. Uh, item two, we get a poll from Harvard Harris, which is the bete noir of our friend Sarah Longwell. She hates the Harvard Harris polls. Um, if Donald Trump is convicted by a jury for inciting the Capitol riots of January, Swift, uh, January 6th, who would you vote for for president? Trump, 54 percent. Biden, 46. If Donald Trump is convicted by a jury for RICO in Georgia, it drops all the way down to Trump, 52 percent. Biden, 48 <laughs> And if Trump is convicted by of crimes related to his handling of classified documents, suddenly that goes to 50-50. I find this entire poll impossible to believe. This is loony on so many levels. One of the things about Harvard Harris, Sarah Longwell's beef with it, is they're always leading Trump. Always. So you start with that. Then you and I have suspected that the voters who say to pollsters now that they will support him less or not at all if he's convicted of a crime don't seem to be showing up here. And the ones they care about, JVL, the classified documents case, if you 
read about the case and you care about it is the strongest. And it turns the voters off in this poll the most. That's rational. However, most, it is the easiest one for Trump to demagogue because he can tell his voters that he took the documents like every president does, including Biden and, and Pence and, and on and on, or vice president, president is, it's what they do. They just, they're, they're in their, you know, valet on the valise on the way out the door. And then the uh, election subversion case is the, which, which is about stealing an election is the next one, which matters. And then the least important one to them is the, um, actual incitement of an insurrection and disruption of the peaceful transfer of power. It, it's just, and as you've noted, Trump's getting to high numbers in here. It's not just beating Biden. Yeah, numbers, which frankly, <laughs> Don't neither he nor any, I mean, so this is important to understand about Trump. Trump has a natural, an absolute ceiling, it seems, of about 48% in the general electorate. Uh, it gets, it is probably on average, right? If you do a high variant, medium variant, low variant scenarios for his, his vote share, 48 is high, 46 is median and 44 is probably low. There is no evidence in any of the elections we've run, either for Trump nationally or various Trump like avatar candidates like Doug Mastriano or Kerry Lake in places where it kind of looks purplish like America, they never get near 50%. Never. And it is, I mean, I, I just don't think it passes the smell test to say that not only of the three cases is the uh, incitement of an insurrection the least uh, hurtful to him, but that if he's convicted of it, he gets to four, 54%. I mean, I just... We haven't had an American presidential candidate get to 54%, I don't think, since Reagan's reelect. I believe that's the last time. Yeah. Barack Obama didn't get to 54%. Like, 54% is a kind of unbelievable landslide, right. which is unthinkable today. Well, I think I mean, Obama's yeah, 2008 landslide was 52. Election. Yeah, I think Obama was at 52 and a bit, yeah. right? Yeah. 52 and change in what is considered the great modern landslide. So it's just, it's a crazy thing. Yeah. But also Trump keeps underperforming his polls. So this is the other thing I want to, to talk about. I wrote about this on Monday after South Carolina. Going back to 2016 Republican primaries, Trump, for all the talk about how like, oh, the polls are biased against Trump. In the primaries, he is a consistent underperformer, often by like way outside the margin of error. And he's underperformed so far in both South Carolina and in Iowa, even more underperformed Iowa, even more. Um, he is attracting a lot of independents to come out and vote against him. He's doing slightly better with pure Republican voters than he did at this point in time. But the people he's losing, I don't think are coming back. Right. I mean, the, the pure Republican voters in 2016, they were all going to come around to him because it was new. They didn't know. These people have seen it now and they're still voting against him. I think some percentage of them, and I think more than one in five of them, is going to not come back to him. I just think all of a sudden he looks very vulnerable. Thoughts? Yeah, I agree. I think so. You wrote about this and, and which so which is so compelling is that the big lie really factors into this. I also liked yeah. the, the, the point you made on the economy, the, the polls showing that if you are a vote, if you're a Republican partisan who who believes uh, Trump that the economy's in the crapper, but if you think it's kind of fine, ish, even, even not, great, not so right? good, even not so good, not so good is the poll question, is the exit poll Trump. question. And if you yeah. believe that he lost and Biden is a legitimate president, you're out. And so yeah. what was so combat was so powerful about that was in the South Carolina primary electorate, a pitiful 36% of the voters who showed believed that Joe Biden was the legitimate president. But of them, you know, Haley cleans up with what was it? 
64 70 percent of them something yeah, that we really have seen like that. Yeah. so they're not having it and that of course showed up in sarah's focus group that you did with her recently that is so interesting because we're drowning in doom and we have all these swing state polls which in polling we know is really all that matters in terms of the general election not right. national polls that show that you know biden's so weak and looks like trump is bounding around with these outside of the margin of error spreads six, seven, eight points. Uh, and and then looking into this data, it really is interesting showing how weak he is with his own party and weak he is with independents who aren't answering these polls. They're showing up mm -hmm. to vote. And if they have an opinion about him lying about the next election, it is going to be so much more salient than we have been considering. And as you noted yesterday... He's trapped. He can't pivot away from this. It's not like in like, you know, you take one position on abortion in the primaries and another position in the general. Like he this is the most important thing to him. He talks about it every time he gets in front of a microphone. And JVL, what will it be like for him? For the part for the people in his party who have endorsed him, they will have to do one of two things. Say he's absolutely right and it was stolen and he really won it. Or John Thune will say Actually, no, there wasn't enough fraud to have made a difference in the outcome. And Joe Biden is president. Either one is bad for him, right? With independence. Yeah. So here's here's my my feeling on this. I think every time Trump agrees to sit down with any member of the media, the first question they should ask him is, who won the 2020 election? And if... And then they should litigate that for the entire, whatever their allotted time is. If he's not willing to admit that he lost, then they should sit there and argue that point and that point alone. And they should bring all the receipts and just hammer him and say, why are you lying about this? Over and over and over. And if it means they never get another interview with him, so what? And if Biden debates him, Biden should just say, hey, Donnie, why won't you admit that you lost and that I beat you? Every, every time it's Biden's turn to talk, should, yeah, why, why won't this guy admit that he lost? <laughs> Just that nothing else, nothing else. Okay. Not to frustrate you, but I want to wind back the tape. How long, long before I came to the board, what, two years? <laughs> how, how far can we go back to you saying this very thing that every interview should begin with that? Oh and of every Republican, not just of Trump. Yes. And the media refuses to do it. And I watch a CNN panel it's all about access. of all Republican, lovely Republican women from South Carolina last week discussing whether they would support Nikki or Trump. And never once did the big lie or the coup or the insurrection come up. Not once. This is what undergirds everything. Everything. This is the foundation upon which the entire modern Republican party is built. And I, I just don't see why anybody should get a pass for it. Uh, two other notes from the South Carolina exit polls. Uh, the first was Nikki absolutely cleaning up with married voters. So this is a big deal. Married people have traditionally broken very, very heavily for Republicans. In fact, there's an old joke like there isn't a gender gap between Democrats and Republicans so much as the marriage gap. Um, you know, re Republicans do great with married women. They do much less well with single women. Uh, I'm not, I mean, I don't want to overinterpret this and say that all the people voting for Nikki in this are going to be voting against Trump because that's not true. But her split on marrieds, it just sets off huge alarm bells for Trump for the general, I think. Where do you think that's coming from? Uh, well, so I think it's tied to education because marriage and education correlate with one another. Uh, it's tied to also geography, right? Suburbans going to wind up married more often than Rose. It's just, I'm sorry, it's just a fact of demography. Um, and the suburban voters are the other group, which are fleeing Trump. And I, if I had to make a single prediction about the election, it would be that right now people have gone into 20, people exited 2020 thinking, well, the Democrats have to start doing better with white working class voters because they've gotten all the votes they can get out of the suburbs. I don't think that's true. 
I think it is possible that this configuration of the Democratic Party versus this configuration of the Republican Party could get to the Saddam Hussein levels of margins in the suburbs, which the Republicans currently get in rural areas. And I don't see any reason why. I mean, right now, I'm saying this from memory. I'm probably wrong. Don't quote me on this. I want to say in 2020, suburban voters were like plus 12 Democrat or plus 17 Democrat. I don't see any reason they can't be plus 25 or plus 30. Didn't they go down in the midterms? Uh, They may have, but it's different, right? In midterms, it becomes a little different because you're – some of them aren't competitive, right? The more democratic places aren't as competitive, you don't get the media turnout isn't the same across the board for the two parties. And and also – Trump had fewer white working class voters in 20 than he did in 16. I believe that he had erosion with them. His percentage. Yes. Percentage. And Biden. Overall numbers up, but his percentage was down. Yes. Biden did make inroads there. So I, anyway, these, the numbers from South Carolina are consistent with Trump continuing to struggle with suburban voters, voters with college educations, uh, voters who are married, like this is, this is a big part of the the Democratic coalition. And I, look, maybe there are bigger margins Trump can still get out of rural voters. Like I don't know, maybe we could go from eighty twenty to ninety ten in the rural areas. Right. But I'm not. Again, I'm just not convinced that we can't get to sixty five thirty five for the Democrats in the suburbs. Because this Republican Party is so antithetical to all of the stuff that like nice, nice middle class suburban people seem to want for their lives and and have as their culture. And it's it just um, I think it just really says something promising that the lie itself is so repellent. You know, we've been talking about the big lie since November of 2020 or b- before because he was planning to to say the election was rigged anyway, right? Um, when he was trying to break the post office. But we, we've been talking about this for so long. And now it's, instead of just polls, polls are polls, but they're not votes. And we're seeing votes. And the idea that that really bothers people and it could bother enough people is is so comforting. It's so rational. Um, so it is an interesting, uh, it's, it, it's an interesting I think weapon for the Democrats uh, to, to yeah. like, as you well, point out, sense. to try to yeah, to try to right. really poke at the at the people in his coalition that are feeling soft on him, and um, and it if you take it. So I am writing something very positive for tomorrow, and if you take it with Ooh. the fact that Trump is kind of broke, um, not just personally, but the Republicans are having trouble raising money. The grassroots energy is diminished. It's not on the rise. Small dollars are down, you know, and you take it w- with this new data, right? It, 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 I'm sort of starting to buy into, you know, the Republicans who've been trying to tell me to calm down and to assure me that his support, um, whatever it is, is deep but not wide, you know, that it's intense but with fewer people. Uh, and it's and it's not he's not laying the country on fire. The thing that scares you and me and keeps us bringing back to doom are those are those swing state polls. And that's Democrats have remarkably, dramatically overperformed polling since for years now yeah. in the Trump era. So it's not that that yeah. won't happen. Biden has to overperform his polls. <laughs> that's what has to happen. Yeah, and the polls have to change. I mean, that's the other thing. Like you know, again, I. I'm, I'm, I'm saying I don't believe the Harvard Harris poll. In generally, I believe polls. Yeah, I think I'm polls not are buying Harvard Harris poll. I'm not enough. Like, and I, think I think the this Harvard that, Harris like, stuff just doesn't make scans. Just... Yeah. So, uh, but directionally, it's interesting too. Yes. Right. So it's in you know within even polls that are bad, watching the trajectories of bad polls against themselves over time can be useful. All right. Well, this is the least dark show we've ever done. I assume we'll be back to form next yeah. week. I'll see you then. Thanks, AB. Good luck, America. Thank <laughs> you.